and we're really grateful for, to you folks for allowing us to come. So Romans chapter 1, I want to look at verses 1 through 6. And I'm going to read it first, and, and I'll watch the time as well. So the Bible says, Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Let's stop here. One of my fondest memories of my dad is that he loves to tell stories, or he loved to tell stories. I have Saturday mornings, from time to time, my dad would bring home donuts and a carton of milk, and not all the time, and I can remember there were seven boys in the family, my mom and dad, we would sit around the table on Saturday morning, eating donuts, drinking milk, and listen to my dad tell stories. Everybody loves a story. The Bible is the story of the gospel, and it's the story of missions. It's the story of God making himself known to people through people. It's a true story because it's infallible and errant because it comes from the mouth of God, right? All scripture is breathed out by God. But it's a story. And when Paul is writing to the Roman church, he's introducing himself, and while he's introducing himself, he's giving a summary of his ministry, and it's a summary of the story of the gospel. And the question is, do we know the gospel story? And are we familiar with the mission story? And what part do we play in the story? That's the question. And we'll be able to answer that question by the end of the, the morning. And so my big idea this morning is that a summary of the story of missions. We're looking at a summary of the story of missions in four simple principles. The first principle is the, the missionary in verse 1. The story of the missionary in verse 1. Missions. We're all called to do that. But then Paul calls himself what? He calls himself an apostle. So, so an apostle, how, by the way, what was in the New Testament? Maybe you can tell me. What's an apostle in the New Testament? Someone give me a description. You don't have to give me the Greek definition. I don't know the Greek definition. But give me a description of an apostle, if you would. How many were there? Twelve. Yeah, there were twelve. And except for Paul was also made an apostle. Who makes them apostles? Right. Jesus makes them apostles. What is the role of an apostle? He's the, the, the word itself means the sent one. The sent one. So an apostle, apostolos, literally means sent one. It's someone who was sent by one in authority to a people with a message from the person who sent them. So let me say that again. An apostle is someone, generally speaking in that culture, was someone sent by one in authority to a people. And the sent one was to represent the one who sent him with the message of the one who sent him. So he wasn't allowed to change the message, right? right. The office of apostle no longer exists in the church. But the ministry, the apostolic ministry is still our mandate. The mandate that we are sent by one in authority. We read in Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission passage, verse 16, Jesus said, I have been given all authority. He is the one who, he sends. He sends with the message of the gospel. We'll look at that in a few moments. But he sends, the missionary is sent through the local church. Missionaries are not sent by a mission agency. 
They're not sent by a non-government organization uh, like Samaritan's Purse. As wonderful as that organization is, they don't send missionaries. The only authority that God has left on earth to send, to call, disciple, and send missionaries is the church. Every missionary is sent by a local church. Let me show you what I mean. Hold your place here. Turn to the right to Acts chapter 13. So hold your place so we can find Romans 1 and find Acts chapter 13. Let me show you what I mean. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And in Acts chapter 13, we have a description of the first church outside of Judea. Actually, the first church outside of the land of Israel. It's a church in Antioch. A church in Antioch. And some persecuted Christians planted this church. And then, then Barnabas came and discipled amongst this church. So Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen which has been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul so notice in that church the leadership Saul Barnabas right and then this then this uh, then uh, Manaen but there was also a guy named Simeon he was called Niger. That's a word for black. I know we have to be sensitive in America today, but where I come from, you don't have to be sensitive about that. <laughs> and so Lucius of Cyrene, that's Africa. The early church already had leaders from Africa. Right. They were African leaders. And I love, t I love pointing that out. Where, where we serve. In verse 2, as they, were, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Remember, Paul said, I, I've been called and I'm separated, he said in Romans chapter 1. Where did Paul get that idea? He didn't get it on his own. He didn't make himself an apostle. <clears throat> God had called him. God had separated him. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to the church. In verse 2, as they fasted and prayed. And I think they were praying about missions. I think that because, now I won't die over that, but I think they were praying about missions because the Holy Spirit showed up and answered their prayer with, if you're praying about missions and who to send on mission, send apart from me Barnabas and Paul. To the work that I have called them. And then in verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Who sent them away in verse 3? Who sent Paul and Barnabas away? The church. The church, the church sends missionaries. And the church goes on mission. Uh, one of, one of, so... so, so and so the Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 15, right? And how shall they preach except they be sent? The only authority on earth that has authority to send missionaries is the church. John Piper, he likes to say, go or send or disobey. I like John Piper. He's a great advocate and servant for missions, but I disagree with him. It should be go and send or disobey. The church goes on mission. And the church sends people who go on mission. The only other option, if we are not going to go, and if we are not going to send, is to disobey. It's the mandate of the church to send missionaries. Missionaries are from a local church. Even Paul was from the very beginning. So, so let's, let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And uh, second of all, there's the message. So we have the, the story of the missionary in verse 1. And then there's a very brief summary of the story of the message in verse 2. So, so the message is, in, let's read verse 1 again in verse 2. Paul, 
a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So speaking of the gospel, God had promised the gospel. When did he promise it? When did God make this promise according to verse 2? What does your Bible say? You go back to action. That's one place. Mm -hmm. that, excellent. But where, when did God promise this? I think in the womb. I think before he was born. Uh, but certainly before Paul was born, the gospel was promised by God before the creation of the world. We know that because Ephesians 1 and verse 4 tells us that God knew us before the foundation of the world. And in Revelation 13 and verse 8, the lamb was, was slaughtered before the foundation of the world. The promise of the gospel is God's promise that he made before even the creation of the world. It wasn't plan B after Adam sinned. Uh -huh. It was all, amen. It was always his plan. He promised it. And God always keeps his promises. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, don't, moms and dads, don't, don't, don't answer this question, but have you ever made a promise that you knew you weren't going to keep? Just to appease somebody. I will play ball with you after supper. You know you're not going to do that. I, I will make cake for you tomorrow. You know you're not going to do that. God never does that. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. And he never makes a promise he doesn't intend to keep. And, and by the way, do you know why the Bible begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the whole chapter in chapter 1 is how God created everything in six literal days. From nothing. It's because God is telling his people, this is who I am. This is how powerful I am. And from here on out in the Bible, I'm going to make promises, and you know I can keep them because I can make the world in six days from nothing. And so a few times in the Bible, you will hear nothing is impossible with God. Of course not. He can make the universe in six literal days from nothing. And so the gospel has been promised and fulfilled, we know, in the person of Jesus Christ. But notice in verse 2, it's promised in or by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What Bible, what half of the Bible did Jesus have? What half of the Bible did Paul have? Which half? Yeah, no, uh -huh. The front half. They were writing the New Testament as they went along, weren't they? Letters. Amen. The gospel does not begin with Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. No. The, the gospel begins with, in the beginning, God, Genesis 1, verse 1, and ends in Revelation 22 with, come Lord Jesus. Hmm. And the, so, so the front of my Bible says, Holy Bible. That's wonderful. Maybe the front of your Bible says, Holy Bible. It could just as easily say, the gospel. The Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is contained in this book in two volumes. Volume 1 is the Old Testament. Volume 2 is the New Testament. But it's the, the Bible. And the whole Bible tells the story of the Gospel. And, and this is how I know that. Hold, hold your place here again. And we're going to do this from time to time. Hold your place here. Turn back to the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And so if you turn backwards, we get to Acts. We already know that. And then from Acts, we get to John, as we're turning to the left. And then just before John is the book of Luke. And Luke chapter 24 is the last page on the Gospel of Luke. So just after Luke chapter 24, you'll find John chapter 1. So let's find Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 44.
Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Let me set this into a brief context. Uh, your pastor and I went to the same seminary. We go to this, and, and we know that the three rules of interpreting the Bible is context. The second rule is context, and the third rule is context. So let me put this into context. Uh, that we, uh, Jesus is just resurrected from the dead. He spent 40 days on earth. He's about to be ascended to the Father. And this is what he says to his disciples. Verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So he says, all things that were concerning me were written where? The law of Moses, he says in verse 44. That's the first five books of the Bible. That's one of my favorite classes to teach. Then he says, the prophets. That's all the prophets. From Moses, who wrote Genesis, to Malachi. And the Psalms. And he says, these, these spoke concerning me. The gospel. In fact, look at verse 45. Then he opened, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Verse 46, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That's the gospel. And he says the gospel began with Moses. The gospel is not about the sinner. The focus of the gospel isn't the sinner. The focus of the gospel is Jesus Christ. And if you, I, I mean, you know, we, we proclaim the call of the gospel, the call of missions, I'm going to say later, is for the glory of God, not for the sake of the lost. Someone might ask, then why did Jesus die? Jesus died because that's the only way that God can get glory out of a human being. We were created for God's glory, to worship Him. That's the only way He can get glory from a human being. So, so missions is about a missionary being sent... And it's about a missionary being sent with the gospel as contained in the two volumes of the Holy Scripture. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so when it comes to missions, it's a challenge to keep the main thing, the main thing. Missions is not Digging wells. That's important stuff. But it's not missions. It's loving our neighbor. But it's not missions. Missions is not about building hospitals. That's important stuff. Believe you me, if we get sick in Zambia, we are in trouble. I've been sick in Zambia. We've both been sick in Zambia. There is no place to go. We would be happy if someone came and built a modern hospital. But that's not missions. Even the college that we have, if we just built a college or a school, that's not missions. But because we equip the next generation of servant leaders in Africa for Great Commission livings, that they will be sent out by a church with the gospel to plant churches, that's missions. Missions is the proclamation of the gospel. And the end result is the planting of churches that glorify God. That's what Paul did. We know that because he wrote to the churches in Galatia. He wrote to the churches in Corinth. He wrote to the churches in Ephesus. He wrote to the church in Philippi. You get the idea. The planting of churches. And, and keeping the main thing, the main thing, the, 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 that which is preached. And I'm sure your pastor preaches the word of God. You need to thank God for that. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. We travel all over the country. We travel, not all over the world, but we travel a lot. Yeesh. 
If your pastor, and I know he is, he's preaching the gospel, you need to thank God for that. Mm -hmm. Just like the main thing here is preaching the gospel, the main thing by the missionary is preaching the gospel. So missions is, the story of missions is, a missionary called by God, sent out by the local church, that they recognize that calling, and they're the ones who send, and they send with the proclamation of the Bible, the gospel. In both volumes. If you want to know the most important thing, the, the, the most important thing about the Christian life, your Bible. Some people will ask me from time to time, one person asked me, because I like to preach from the Old Testament, what's the best book to read on the history of Israel? I tell them the Bible. <laughs> read the Bible. So sometimes our students, they like to listen to podcasts of different preachers. I don't blame them. They don't get. They don't. They don't come from solid preaching. And there's some preachers that are famous here. I never heard of till I arrived there. I don't know. I don't know that guy. And, but I tell them, stop it, stop it. Read your Bible. When you're here, especially, read your Bible. The Bible. We send out people with the message of the Bible. Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. I hope you left your place there. If you didn't, you're searching like I am right now. Romans chapter 1. So, so it's missions with the message, and then there's the Messiah. That's verse 3 and 4. Right? We send out a missionary with the message that proclaims the Messiah. We proclaim... The promised Savior. Remember, God promised the gospel. Well, the gospel came to us. Verse 3 and 4, in this person. Verse 3 and 4, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Notice Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he's choosing his words carefully. He just told us that the gospel was promised by God before the creation of the world, given to us through the prophets. Then he uses the word concerning, concerning his son. So if the major theme of the Bible is the gospel and missions, the main character of the Bible is Jesus. And Paul calls him, first of all, notice he says concerning his, what's the word there? Concerning his what? Son. That word comes from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, and Psalm 2. And the idea is he's God the Son. It speaks of his deity and it speaks of his authority as judge to rule the world. The Son. Then Paul uses the phrase Jesus Christ, right? And so 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 when when remember when the, the, the angel showed up to Joseph? In Matthew chapter 1, it said, Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sin. Jesus means Savior. Paul would write to his spiritual son, Timothy. This is a trustworthy saying and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners. Not ignorant people. Sinners. Not sick people. Not people who don't have water, sinners. And then Paul said, of whom I am chief. An amazing thing. So, 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 so Paul is, is the, the, the gospel message is Jesus the Savior. So you'll hear some people say Jesus was a great teacher. He was. Jesus left a great example to, for us to follow. He did. Jesus was a great man. That's true. But if he's not Jesus the Son of God and Savior... All those other things are blasphemous. They're blasphemy. To say only that Jesus was only a teacher and not the Son of God, the Savior. To say that he was only a good example and not the Son of God, the Savior. To say that he was a... That's blasphemy. He was, he's God who became man to save. To save us from hell so we can live a life that glorifies him. And so he's Jesus Christ, Christos. And, and that, that means he's the anointed one. He's the promised 
king of kings that God promised all the way back to the days of Abraham. He's the promised king of kings, and he, so he says, he uses those three terms, and then he says, our what? Lord. Master. Pastor and I remember the, the debates of the 1980s. We do. We were, some of you young people don't know 1980 actually existed. It existed. I was there. And the debate was, does Jesus have to be Lord to be Savior? Remember that? It's a silly debate. He is Lord. The only issue is, does he have our allegiance or not? He's Lord. He is Lord. And so he says, which, look at verse 3, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. He's the promised king that God made a promise to David that he would send a king with an everlasting kingdom through the lineage of David. That's Jesus. But he's also declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is everything. If he rose from the dead, then he is who God says he is. Mm -hmm. If he rose from the dead, then every promise that God made in the gospel from Genesis to Revelation is true. And if he rose from the dead, he's going to come to judge the living and the dead. And one day, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. He rose from the dead. And it's the gospel that reconciles us to him. In fact, let me, let me show you the complete cure of the gospel. Hold your place here. Turn to the right and find Colossians. Colossians. So let me pull out my... Yeah. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. So you get through 1 Corinthians, you'll get through 2 Corinthians as you turn to the right, you'll come to Galatians, then to keep turning to the right, from Galatians you come to Ephesians, then you'll come to Philippians, then before 1 Thessalonians you'll come to Colossians. So it's towards the end of your New Testament, Colossians chapter 1, and Colossians is really about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1, verse 19 and verse 20 says this about Jesus. Colossians 1, verse 19 and verse 20. So the Bible says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That is the fullness of deity dwell in Jesus. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now, remember your Bibles after the fall. <clears throat> right after Adam's sin. What word would you use to describe the world after Adam's sin? You remember the world where Jesus looked and said, ah, it's very good. Now, what word would you use? Is it very good? Mm -hmm. chaos. chaos is a great word. Chaos is actually the opposite of peace. The opposite of peace isn't conflict. It's actually chaos. But God is reconciling. Look at verse 20. What is God reconciling? <laughs> How many things? All things. And how is he reconciling all things? Look at verse 20. Have you made peace by what? Through the blood of the cross. So, sin entered the world. Boom! Chaos, right? Our relationship with God is broken. Our relationship with each other is broken. The planet is cursed. It's chaos. The gospel reconciles. It brings peace, harmony, 
everything will one day be a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible says in Revelation 21, where God will have a people with whom he can dwell. He's going to, everything is cured by the gospel. The gospel, God is reconciling everything. Do you see why Jesus is our only hope? People will hope in strange things, won't they? I mean, people hope in some very strange things. And by the way, you realize that COVID isn't a problem. That COVID is one of the pieces of the puzzle that God is using towards building the new heaven and the new earth. It's part of his plan. The people was they they will trust in some strange things. There's only one person worthy of trust and hope. That's why we preach Jesus. So let's go back. Sent by the local church, God's authority on earth, right? With the message of the gospel preaching the hope of the Messiah, hope in nothing else. Because you know there's been a trend in missions that a person can remain a Hindu and worship God. Mm. You're right. <laughs> that a person can remain in Islam and worship God. That's not biblical. The basics of the story of missions is the missionary with the message of the gospel that proclaims the Messiah. And then let's look at a summary of missions in verse 5. The summary of missions is in verse 5. By whom, that is Jesus. By whom, whom? Jesus. We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So Paul says, by whom? By Jesus. We have received grace. And I think you know what grace is. Grace in its bare bones meaning is a gift of God. We've received grace and apostleship. He, he says we have. And remember an apostle, the modern day version of an apostle is a missionary. Someone sent by the church on mission with the message of the gospel to proclaim the Messiah. And so what Paul is saying here is to participate in missions is a gift. It's an act of grace. It's a privilege. It's not a, oh, we have to do it. No, it's a privilege to participate in missions. The church's mandate is missions, and it's a gift. By the way, again, do you know why God created everything in six days? With no one's help, right? I mean, if I get a flat tire, don't you enjoy help? I enjoy help. At least someone to, you know, to, 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 to miserate with me to be in my own misery with me, to share the misery, right? I need help. Did, did, G, did God need advice from someone? Man, you know sometimes we hang a picture, we, we get advice, don't we? That picture's <laughs> kind of crooked. We get advice. God didn't need any of that. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help for missions either. By His grace, He devised a plan where he invites us to participate. Do you understand that? He, can, he will build his church with or without us. By his grace, he invites us. That's powerful. And so he says, for obedience to the faith, that is, for people who come to believe. That's, that's what that phrase means. People who come to believe and they live a life that honors God because the Holy Spirit changes them, changes us. Among whom? What does your Bible say? So, 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 to, so, so for obedience to the faith, among whom? All what? Well, among all nations, right? So the gospel goes to all nations for the sake of his name. And the sake of his name is simply to say for his glory. Missions is not. Missions is not. For the sinner. It is. 
But there, there can only be one thing that can be the main thing, right? Missions is about the glory of God. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 96 and verse 8 that God is worthy of the glory due His name. It's really bad if someone's going to hell. That's bad. We love our neighbor, so we proclaim the gospel. But it's a travesty, a sin against God, if a people do not worship Him. Missions is obedience to the call. In verse 6, he says, among whom are ye? Among whom are us? We are the called of Jesus Christ. And part of that call is to participate with him in making him known to the nations for the glory of God. Would, would, would you pray? This is what I plan on asking the churches. You tell me if it's a good idea. Would you test your love for God, moms and dads, aunties and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, by praying and asking God to send your children, not someone else's children. Don't pray, oh God, send someone from this church as a missionary. No, no, no. Would you send us? Would you pray to send our children? Would you pray to participate in missions? Be that's the story. And we only have two options. Go and send or disobey. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we're grateful and thankful to you for the ministry of the greatest ministry that you are doing on earth today making yourself known to the nations. You're inviting us to participate, God. Help us to obey for your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank you too. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stand up. Jake and Tate, I'm going to ask the two of you would please to Take up the offering, please. Father, we thank you for writing for us the opportunity to return what you have entrusted us with as students. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity of being able to return to you our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. We ask that your will be done, that all of this might be used for the furthering of the kingdom. We thank you, brother, <clears throat> thank you for the privilege and the honor and the glory to be able to do this. We ask this in Christ's name, that he might be honored and glorified. All of us together say, Amen. Amen. Praise God. And from God. whom all, all blessings flow. flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.